So, well, Julian, let's start with you. Uh, how unprecedented was the role religion played this time around? Well, we've seen a lot of religion in this campaign, but what we need to remember is we've seen this before. Uh, just in the recent uh, 20th century, we remember when John F. Kennedy ran in 1960 and his Catholic faith became an issue. Billy Hargis, a conservative anti-communist preacher, was very important in Goldwater's run in 64. Uh, through other examples into the 2000 election with George Bush. So uh, I think you know, there might be a little more of it in this election, but it's certainly not something unfamiliar to American politics. But it just seemed to take so many shapes and so many, you know, so wide ranging across the spectrum this time around. Yeah, I, thought, I mean, for me, it was the role of the preachers in the campaign. The individual preachers became part of the contest a little more rather than the actual faith of the candidates uh, or, you know, the kind of moral majority who have been very active. This was about particular candidates, Reverend Wright, for example. Uh, and that was a little bit different. But still, you know, I was I'm finishing a book on Jimmy Carter in 76, and his faith was front and center in the campaign, including his relations with his church back in Georgia and his born again um, experience. So, so we've seen a lot of this before. Burns, you were part of a strategy for Hillary Clinton, and certainly we saw her appearing in churches a lot, speaking a lot about her personal faith. How unusual was this for the Democrats, especially in recent memory? Maybe not going back to Jimmy Carter, but certainly in the last few elections, the Democrats were really criticized for being afraid of religion. Um, what, what changed this time around? I, I, I think what we've seen and what's been going on and why the interest in why it's so prevalent out there this time around the country is that Democrats have engaged in an organized manner, which hasn't been the case for some, for some time hasn't been that Democrats haven't been people of faith, that we just haven't been organizing, working out there. And then the two front runners both happen to be very comfortable talking about their faith, um, both active in their churches. So, you know, organizing faith communities, having candidates comfortable talking about faith on the Democratic side while on the Republican side, very interesting, you know, dynamic. All of a sudden, you had a Republican field that wasn't as comfortable as they had been over past cycles, which is really interesting when Republicans have had a very organized um, faith community, faith organizing for several decades now. How so, much of it was authentic faith expression and how much of it was a little political strategizing? Just to say, hey, we've been losing the presidential elections because of this. Uh, we need to step it up a notch. Yeah, four, four years ago after the Kerry loss, um, I was with the speakers of, with the leader's office, Leader Pelosi at the time. And out of that, you know, there was a discussion that, you know, we needed to engage. We need to have a broader conversation with the country. Out of that came the Democratic House Faith Working Group, which has been a center pivot in the growing work of the Democratic Party and the American faith community. Um, so, sure, there's some organizing there, absolutely. Organizing, strategizing. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, you know, what comes with that is um, when you get on the ground, when you get in Alabama, when you get in Kansas, when you get in California, you know, your candidates have to have an authenticity that you have to organize around. Um, if not, you're going to get caught. It has to be real. And that's a premise that we've been acting on on our side. And that's why I went to the fact that our two key primary candidates were comfortable and real in their faith. So you saw something, you saw things you would not have seen last cycle, the last several cycles. Senator Clinton at the pulpit of Saddleback with Rick Warren talking about. AIDS, and an evangelical church of that side talking about AIDS. Um, you can't dismiss the fact that the evangelical Catholic communities have also expanded their conversation about more issues, not just two or three hot button issues, climate change, poverty, issues like that, which was, which was serendipitous for Democrats, which, you know, offered us the added advantage of our attempts to, to have a larger conversation. Mm -hmm. It isn't the story about religion suddenly coming into politics. I think the bigger story is, is just what we said, 
it's a kind of broader struggle conservatives are going through. Democrats have mobilized for a community that has been pretty lockstep uh, with the Republican Party since the 1970s. Part of the history of the conservative movement was the mobilization of evangelical Christians, their alliance with the Republican Party, uh, and the same with Catholic voters, who traditionally have been Democratic, uh, but moved with Reagan and onward uh, to the Republican Party. Uh, lately, it seems with evangelicals, it, it's not clear how much movement there is yet. Uh, with Catholics, there seems to be a possibility for the Democrats to win back uh, some support. So this is much, uh, I think, a kind of political shift. Uh, combined with the candidate, both candidates, but now Barack Obama, a Democrat who, unlike John Kerry, is very comfortable talking about his faith, talking about his church, for better or worse, uh, and speaking in kind of, uh, you know, uh, religious rhetoric. Uh, and so the combination of the politics and the personal, I think, uh, has changed the democratic side of the equation. Sure. But does, so does that mean that what we saw this time around was in some ways unique to this election, or is it, you know, setting precedent for the future? But I, I certainly think there's precedent being set. In, set. But, you know, to go to, to, to pile on here, Four years ago, about this time, if you remember, there was a large group of key ministers, mega church ministers, those who have significant databases of other ministers around the country in laity that um, sent out an email into the country reminding people of faith to vote their core principles. And then they listed two or three core principles, you know, talking about abortion, gay issues, stuff like that. It was a very, um, um, you know, strongly worded email that went out at the last minute and was written about a whole lot because it had a big impact around the country. Um, you haven't seen that this time. Um, you haven't felt the level of visceral attacks from key evangelical and Catholic leaders. It's there. We have cer it's That's certainly the there, but it. it's not, it's, it's different this time because, you know, as I would say, you know, building relationships, um, organizing helps first smooth the edges. You don't get as many splinters when you go out there working because you've built relationships and you know each other and you're a little less willing to be as harsh when you attack. So even in the evangelical community, there's a different dynamic. Now on election day, if that plays out in the next step of who votes for who, I don't know yet. We'll see. They show that evangelicals, there's not been a wholesale shift to the Democrats. No, and it, you know, four years does not equal 20 or 30 years of organizing. So, and, and you know, we have, you know, also have to say, you know, do we want to mirror image from our side? Do we want to be a mirror image of what's evolved on the Republican side? I'm not sure we do. I think we just want a level playing field with a fair conversation and, and I, then when, you, when we get to talk about poverty, or for climate change, whatever it is, there's not a wall between us and the evangelical community. We can have that conversation. Then I think we can organize and compete. So it takes time. Obviously in the polling, if you look at churchgoers who go weekly, um, Senator Obama is about where Senator Kerry was. Senator um, McCain is six or seven points below where Bush was. So that suggests even in the very core conservative evangelicals, there is a small community that has stepped into the swing community, you know. So I would call that progress in four years. But And we have seen, just I've seen in the last week, um, emails going out, maybe aimed at some of those swing communities. I think there, I've seen some real fear in the, the sort of leadership of the religious right that, that some of their core people might be abandoning ship. And so you have yeah. seen a heightened rhetoric. And in the last days, we've seen in some campaigns allegations of, you know, people aren't God-fearing. You know, and and sure. it, it's really religion has become 
not just this lofty, you know, aren't we talking about our values and putting them on our policies, but it's also become a real wedge. It's become a point of controversy. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, three things are interesting. One is conservatives have not had a lock on religion for much of American history. Uh, both kind of liberals and conservatives in the 20th century had their moments. So in the 60s, religious figures were important to civil rights and were important to the fight against Vietnam. Uh, earlier in the 30s and 40s, you had many liberal organizations who came out in favor of the New Deal or critical of harsh anti-communism. So they're kind of both sides have a tradition. You also have a second factor is that religious groups have changed. Uh, you know, there's been a big contest over Jewish voters since uh, the 1970s, traditionally democratic. Reagan made some inroads uh, during the 1980s, as did the current Bush, although they tend to still vote uh, very democratic on, on, uh, on, on most issues. But it, there, there's certain pockets, as with Catholics, where you sense they can move. They're, they're not uh, permanently aligned. They just have been, evangelicals have been, I think, most with conservatives. And, and finally, you know, the crisis of, of the Bush presidency is a crisis for the whole conservative coalition. And I think the story you're seeing uh, with uh, religious organizations is a story you're seeing with other groups, fiscal conservatives uh, to neoconservatives and realists in foreign policy. Different factions are uh, responding now to the failures of the Bush administration. And that opens up the potential, we don't know if it'll happen, for Democrats to pick some of these groups up, just as Reagan did in 1980 with liberals, uh, with certain Democratic groups. I mean, it's a, kind of, it's a very similar moment, uh, although this time uh, conservatives are in the bad position, uh, whereas in 1980 it was liberals who were struggling to keep their uh, factions in the tent. My, um, the, the fun thing about what I do, it takes me everywhere. And I get to sit down and meet with, you know, people who are, are liberals, who are progressives. Then, you know, I get to go to places, sit down and talk to very conservative people. And it's interesting. It's fun. I'm a Southern Baptist out of Mississippi, evangelical, and, um, you know, have been in Ms. Pelosi's Most office. Most people think Senator you don't Clinton's. exist, by the way. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm the one. And um, um, so it, it's a fascinating journey. But here's what I wanted to say. You know, just a few years ago, I'm here meeting. I, I'm asked to come speak to about 300 young liberals. I don't. Even, I'm not sure the name of the group now, but they were liberal activists type that go out, working campaigns, go door to door. You know, these foot so soldiers, very progressive. And we had this great discussion. And during the Q and A. Um, something dawned on me about the group, that they were in thirds. A third of that liberal group were faithful and got it and was applauding what I was talking about and what the House Democrats were doing in terms of outreach. Another third didn't necessarily get it, but they respected it. The last third were terrified of the idea, totally terrified of it. And I went home thinking about that last third, and I thought about, okay, let's assume that that third were not churchgoers growing up, that what they learned and experienced about faith was what they learned, learned on TV in the 80s and the 90s. And thinking about those who are many, many good people who have been on TV preaching the gospel, but thinking about those that they've experienced through that um, through that prism, you know, might be fair to assume they could be disturbed by having that pushed into their politics. So I think that's a fair thing, and I've often found that a lot of groups I get in front of, I think, are kind of largely divided in thirds. Well, I wanted to ask you also about the leadership of the Democratic Party and some of the hierarchy there, because the real base for the Democrats has been these unaffiliated secular voters. That's been a growing base and very important to them. How do, how do you balance that, you know, um, reaching out to people of faith without alienating that, those very important voters? Yeah. Well, there, there are two key factors to that. One is electoral capability, getting over 50%. I mean, there's a bottom line here in politics that's real. If I'm a person of faith, then the big guy, God knows my heart, why not share it? I mean, there's a bottom line here, and that's winning on election day. That's what you do in this business. 
And when, you know, 80-something percent of a nation uh, believe in God, 25% of the electorate is evangelical, nearly 30% is Catholic, throw in another 12% or so that's mainline, you know, you've got a significant base of voters who see the world through values shaped by their church and by their faith. Um, so that's important. But do you, get politics. do you get pushback? The, the second thing, and I, I'm coming at this from how is this working now, why is it working? The second key factor is, is that party leadership has largely embraced this. Let's think about who the key leaders of the Democratic Party are. Barack Obama. Obviously, he embraces faith, his faith personally, and he's comfortable with it in the campaign. Number two, Senator Clinton, a United Methodist who is comfortable and has been. Nancy Pelosi, devout Catholic, um, always going to Mass. Uh, got a little trouble with the bishops, though, for some of her statements. Got in a little trouble, but she did fine coming through that and um, remained true to who she is as a Catholic. And, um, you know, who has supported this and pushes it forward? Howard Dean, who, surprisingly to some, you know, has created faith outreach as a significant office within the DNC. Jim Clyburn, South Carolina, who has been a champion all along. So you have to consider the fact that, you know, leaders of the party are not necessarily against this. You, you know, what you brought up, you kind of went to constituent groups that are key in the party. What's extremely, extremely important is to be part of their conversation to make sure we're at their table, um, finding the common issues and the common ground, because ultimately the Democratic Party's principles don't change. You know, we're not, at, you know, there's not an attempt to change what the party is, what we believe. The goal is, is to deliver who we are to all of the country. I think, I mean, one of the things that are important are certain policies that cut across this division that might exist. Again, going back to Reagan, you have the same, similar kinds of tensions among Republicans. Uh, many neoconservatives wanted nothing to do with the moral majority. And, and they didn't see themselves, or and the neoconservative Democrats who shifted to the GOP, didn't see what they had to do with activists who were railing against abortion. Uh, and one of the successful stories of Ronald Reagan was to find uh, the issues that could create some kind of fragile unity between the group. So anti-communism was very important because uh, it was an issue obviously on foreign policy that was important to the neoconservative, but it was infused with many religious ideas about kind of godless communism. And, and this was one of the areas they could come together. And so I think public policy and finding those policy questions is going to be important if Democrats want to kind of replicate this. So it might be the issue of poverty, which is one of the issues we've heard a lot about, kind of inequality in the economy and the connection with tax policies. And, and that's the kind of issue where many religious groups can come to terms with a secular suburban uh, coastal person who never goes to church or synagogue or anywhere. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of a lesson they need to take from conservatives because it, it's fragile. I mean, even under Reagan, well, many yeah. social conservatives were furious by the mid 80s that they were being ignored. And they still are, and, and that, that are. has come through in this election. I mean, Same to thing. what extent is the Republican coalition, especially with figuring out where the religious conservatives fit, um, yep. you know, to what extent is that being reevaluated, or might it be reevaluated after next Tuesday? Well, Bush, I mean, when he was elected, was seen as a, a kind of very spiritual leader, very open and, and comfortable with his religion, and with Karl Rove aggressively courted uh, the religious right in the way we saw with Reagan in 1980. But there has been a lot of frustration. There were leaks by, about, I remember, stories that Karl Rove had very cynically talked about uh, just appealing to these groups as a total electoral strategy. And I think there's a sense with some that in the end, the Bush administration didn't do much in terms of policy uh, to placate and to uh, please these groups. So there is that level of frustration, which, it, again, it's an ongoing story since the 70s between the religious right and Republican leadership? I think it's a stepping as much as I can out of my partisanship and just trying to comment <laughs> on the Republican as much as Party. You can. Um, that's, it's fascinating what's going on here because um, 
I think this, I think the Civil War, this, we're fixing to really see it. We're fixing to experience it within the Republican Party. Governor Palin coming onto the ticket, um, kind of all of a sudden found herself positioned in the center of this gulf with the cultural conservatives on one side and this Republican establishment, Republican elites, I'm not sure. Something bigger about it than just Rotary Club business people. And um, so it's really interesting what we're going to experience and see happening within within the Republican Party because, because both of them together make a base that's large enough to be competitive. When it gets split up, it's problematic for them. I think that I think that the faith community is the key part and by far the largest part of one side of the Gulf. But I think you have to broaden it a little bit. I think there's something cultural within the Republican Party that's dividing them. You know, Senator, Go Governor Palin wasn't just her being an Assemblies of God member, but, you know, seeing Ms. Noonan, George Will, and others pretty much go after her if it's thinking the mic's off or it's just writing straight up, going after her, you know, it was more than just concerns about faith. You know, there seemed to be, you know, a, a small town um, you know, a, a difference in who she is. It wasn't just experience. So I, I think there's some culture, I think there's a cultural divide there where faith, evangelicalism plays a huge, massive, massive part in it. What is interesting, I was just thinking as you made your comments, it's, it's the role of secular candidates that seems to be changing. It's hard to imagine a candidate running truly as a secular American. Uh, at this point, there's almost mm. a bipartisan consensus that we want people who are comfortable with faith, who are involved in faith. And uh, I think John Kerry struggled with that a bit. He didn't want to talk about it. Uh, and and uh, you know, I can't remember exactly how he's positioned on this issue. But, but it is, that might be a change that, that we are going through in terms of the candidates. This is now a base that you need in both parties. What a, what a profound difference in the debates when you just go to the abortion question. Yeah. Four years ago, Senator Kerry struggling a bit to get through that. And this year, Senator Obama just, bam, going to reducing abortions, not criminalizing women, but we've got to reduce the number of abortions in this country. And then McCain coming right back in and basically agreeing on some level, you know. It was a fascinating difference. But that was driven largely, you know, by folks like Reverend Jim Wallace and Rosa DeLauro, Congresswoman DeLauro, people on the Hill who have fought for a number of years for this to be the right argument because it's real. We can do this. We can get away from a debate that hasn't changed in 30 years and hasn't changed a thing. And, you know, we can do something out there and we think it's a winning message as well. Well, and, and to what extent is it also giving cover for Catholics and evangelicals who want to vote Democratic, but just that issue, that abortion issue, has always been a stumbling block. I mean, you know, there's some political mm -hmm. strategy again that comes into play here. They work. They work together, though. I mean, it's it's uh, kind of response. It, it's, you could see it as a genuine response to the concerns of Democratic Catholics who have been swayed to the Republican because of those so because of abortion and some other social issues. Uh, so the political, strategic, and the theological and religious can converge nicely, as they did with conservatives. I, th I think there's a legitimate uh, way to see both are at work here. Sure. The ultimate, one of the ultimate issues in play, and one of the goals from our side, is to address all issues as values. I mean, there's been a real tendency, especially um, within the media in some ways, that it's been branded in them, and, and even for us on our side, somewhat, it's been branded in us that when we hear the term values voters, we tend to think proper noun, two or three hot button issues. And that's not the case for people of faith. It's just not accurate. You know, as I said earlier, you know, we all see and experience the world through a set of values. If you're a churchgoer, if you're a person of faith, those values are shaped and impacted by your church, by your faith. Everything's a value. This year, 
you can yell and scream and fight over abortion. I think our message is really good and is important. But what's driving faith voters this time? It's probably most of them, like every single American, economic issues are impacting faith families. And values play a significant role there. I mean, it's about the strength of your family. It's about the family unit. It's about communities. It's about the ability to have the income to take care of grandmama, you know? And when you talk about that, back in the primaries, when, when it was, you know, when we were doing our faith outreach, I didn't develop a special message. I didn't veer from our general message. I took the economic message that Senator Clinton was sharing with the whole country and simply went into Catholic universes, evangelical universes, and delivered that message. So all of a sudden, faith communities were becoming a way to deliver the message. There's a universe, Ohio is easy, you can zip code out Catholics, ethnic Catholics, you know. It's, but you know, you go in and mine out databases, profile, model and stuff and, and, and find large databases and deliver a message. In this case, our faith message was the economic message. And if you will look at the exit polling during the primaries, um, those voters now moving to Senator Obama, you know, were largely in every primary cutting pretty hard for Senator Clinton. Let's get back to um, talking about religion as a wedge, as a, a point of controversy. I'm thinking about the whole Jeremiah Wright situation. And what, you know, that sort of brought up a, a lot of questions about the role of the media as well in all of this. Um, and, you know, do candidates deserve some kind of a zone of religious privacy, especially when religion is part of the political discourse? At what point is, you know, what happens inside the congregation um, relevant to the political campaign. I, I mean, I think once candidates, uh, as candidates have opened this issue up and promote their relationship to the church or the synagogue or whatever and, and promote their own uh, faith, it's inevitable uh, in this age of media that the cameras are going to go into the places of worship and look at who the preachers are, uh, especially when you have people who are very political on the pulpit. and. And with Wright, you do have someone who is explicitly political. It's part of what he's trying to do, part of what he speaks about. Uh, so kind of the idea you can keep the media out, I just think won't happen. Uh, and, and, and so kind of with, I think with, with Obama, there was two issues. One is this issue, is he a Muslim? That's what kind of I think has been a, a more aggressive wedge issue, just characterizing someone as something they're not, and then suggesting that what they're not shouldn't be legitimate in presidential politics, which goes back to Colin Powell's statement. The second is right, which I, th I think more was about race and politics than religion in the end. Uh, I don't think anyone was calling Obama for his religion or what he, uh, what he prayed for in the church. I think the real issue was what uh, Wright was saying about uh, foreign policy, America's role, 9-11, uh, and, and the various issues that came out. Uh, so in the end, I, I think uh, that was the case with Wright. But in any case, I think there is no zone. It's impossible. This is not going to be a zone. And if candidates bring this up, everything is fair game. I think the only people who really get caught unfairly are uh, religious leaders who are not political at all, who never intended to be on the public in their congregation, and, and don't even talk about politics, and somehow are brought up. We haven't seen much of that. Most of the people who are brought up are political people. Same with McCain. Uh, and, and, and the person, uh, the, um, I can't remember the name as we're speaking, but whose endorsement, whose endorsement he announced, uh, denounced. Uh, but those are political uh, uh, leaders, so that's going to come in. Well, it's one thing when a, a pastor endorses a candidate and, and you know, jumps into the political fray, but what about the politicians? And again, it gets back to from the pulpit, you know, what they preach about, and to what extent are candidates accountable? for what happens inside their church or synagogue or mosque, you know, everything that happens. Sarah Palin attended church in Alaska that also hosted some, you know, meetings about uh, gay issues and, you know, people saying that they can be transformed from being gay and that was very controversial. You know, is that something that she should be held accountable for? 
again, it's, it's gonna, it, she will have to be held accountable. And we, we have seen this before. Carter, in the last week of the 76 election, there's a whole scandal with his church back in Georgia, uh, which is segregated. And there's a whole controversy over racial segregation in his church, which ultimately he stays in for a while. Uh, and it erupts like the week before the election. And it's about what went on when he wasn't even there. Uh, but especially since then, I just, it, it's, it's hard to see that, that that can be kept out uh, in, in any respect. It's, it's you know, if you open the door and invite someone in, then they should be able to come in, press included. It's, um, you know, some of this is a question of the type of coverage or even the quality of coverage, not that they're covering it. Um, and I think that's a valid conversation. We worked hard down beyond the, the, the friction and, and the hot issues, you know, just going to church on Sunday. You, uh, you know, Senator Clinton, for example, um, enjoyed her Methodist services on Sunday morning and preferred not to have them on the schedule um, just for the simple fact that you could be in Decorah, Iowa at First United Methodist Church and those four cells wanting to have some prayer time had 50 TV cameras roaming around their church, you know. And um, so we worked hard to respect that. Two, again, back back to the, the type of coverage. Um, you know, you're dealing with very personal choices that a person makes, not just that they were a member of a church for 20 years, but you know, where they baptized their children and where they sat in Sunday school and learned the good book. And so there are very personal choices that has to be, you know, respected to some level. The questions are fair. I think in terms of right that Senator Obama was, was very honest and straight up. He went out to the microphone and talked about it, answered questions, gave a key set of remarks that a lot of people think was yet another key moment for him. He's had many and um, did a good job. Of, but ultimately of he was forced it. to leave that church. You know, that's a church where he and his family had been members for 20 years and because of all the political hoopla. He, he chose to leave, but you know, he, he stuck in, you know, the first couple of times. But finally, you know, I think we all know that, that the frustration came from within. You know, he, he got frustrated and and moved on, and that's a hard choice, and that's a tough decision, and I, I hate it. I hate it had to happen, and certainly the media played a role in that. I tell you, it's hard with all the 24-hour news going on. It is hard to find news. I mean, you turn on it every night, and you know, even Campbell Brown's pontificating now. You turn it on, you're getting her opinion. You're not getting news, and um, you know, at, at some point, that needs to be evaluated. The poor print press is going broke and newsrooms are cut back and they're struggling with man hours and, and stuff, so we're depending on a really interesting press paradigm right now, and the internet is playing such a significant role where bloggers are driving into news. You go into places like the Twin Cities and you read the Star Tribune and then go look at yesterday's blog from some guy living in the Twin Cities and you'll find that the news was driven, you know, out of the blogs there. And, and so it's a, it's a really, it's really interesting what's going on in the press world that impacts everything in politics, but certainly faith when you have sometimes a set of reporters trying to understand, for example, Pentecostalism and you read through the article and you can check, check, check things that just aren't exactly right in well, terms of talking about who Pentecostals are. I think, I mean, the other place the media isn't very good, I think, in covering this, I, I, I'm not a historian, but as a son and a family of rabbis, so I have a familiarity with religious institutions, is when you're talking not about um, the theological arguments of a religion, you're talking about why did Barack Obama belong to this church, right? And the church uh, is it's more than one statement by the religious leader. Uh, so it's, it's unfair what happens is the media gets two clips from Reverend Wright that are played over and over. It's the YouTube uh, effect. Uh, and that becomes the discussion of the link. So we don't really know about the church itself, kind of what attracted Barack Obama and his family to that church, 
what's the institution like, what's the community like, what does Reverend Wright say out of those two YouTube minutes. Uh, and, and I think when we just cut it to that, that that's, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to happen, but it's not fair coverage. And I don't think it gives us a better sense of a candidate, Republican or Democrat. Uh, so I think that's where also the treatment needs to be more careful. Yeah. Well, we had, we had, just a quick add on, we have to understand demographics too. Um, you know, Senator Obama and I, wow, the next president could be from my generation. I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, <laughs> but starting with my generation younger, you've got a whole different attitude toward brand loyalty. And I, th this is the point I'm making. You know, you don't, if you're born a Baptist, you don't necessarily die a Baptist. You, you know, you start, you get married, start having babies, the Methodist church a mile down the road may be more attractive than the Baptist church 20 miles down the road. You know, you, you, you make different choices or you make your choices based on different things out there. So the, the point I'm making is, is that his choice for going to that church is very personal. You know, he makes them for different reasons based on his family, stuff. There's not necessarily a denominational tie like it would be with older generations. And I think that's important to consider. And it's not mentioned much, and it's a bit, it's a bit academic, but I think it's fair to, to point out. Well, I know we want to save some time for questions from the audience as well. So let me just maybe end our time by um, Talking, looking ahead a little bit, based on what we've seen this time around, what do you think are some of the key issues and elements this time around that may indeed be precedent setters for next time around? I mean, if Barack Obama loses, if Democrats don't do as well as they're hoping, having done this big faith push, does that mean that in the future Democrats won't do a faith push? No. I mean, I don't think that... Um we're go I, I think we're going to see the continued, you know, bringing into the fold, um, you know, faith organizing within campaigns and within the party. And here's why. Um, four years ago, Kerry did have a faith outreach director. Um, she's excellent. She's still, Mara Vanderslice, still very hardworking and doing a great job out there. Um, she was at a corner office. She may have had a telephone. Um, they didn't let her use it much, though. <laughs> she, would, she would get the um, schedule from the public website, you know. And, and um, um, this time, you know, in mine and Joshua Dubois' case, Joshua was with Senator Obama and, again, is an outstanding person. Um, we're senior advisors with direct line to not just the other senior staff to the candidate and um, dialogue with them daily um, part of the decision making process. What that does, it adds a larger viewpoint to making decisions within a campaign. And that's valid in terms of a successful campaign is getting all the points of view on the table. We're not quoting scripture in the morning staff meetings um, or pointing out you know, Methodism, five-point Calvinism versus, you know, Wesley. We're, you know, we're talking about, you know, demographics in certain areas and, you know, Catholic voters in large blocks in Ohio and how they'll react to something, um, offering things, offering language that works better in a population and thoughts and that's helpful to a campaign and, and you know core activists and leaders within the party are seeing that and appreciating it more and more. I mean I think on the, the com both parties are going to compete for these votes more aggressively into the next election cycle. Democrats, whatever happens, are going to sense there's some movement uh, and, and there's some possibility for capturing a greater part of the vote. Again, it's like in the late 70s when Republicans realized evangelicals were not happy with Jimmy Carter and, and they could compete for those votes. And I think conservatives are not going to give the vote up easily. I mean, this has been a key part of the coalition and, and they have very strong organizational and personal ties. And so my guess is the next election cycle will be more competitive, more fierce uh, to, to secure these votes. 
Um, the other big issue out of this election, again, it was that moment when John McCain pulled the microphone away from the woman, asking, saying she's scared that he's a Muslim. Uh, and that's kind of the John F. Kennedy Roman Catholic question. Uh, why, you know, what, why was that statement out there? And, and when will we have the first uh, Muslim American uh, run? Uh, but that's the one theological religious question I thought was raised in this campaign, uh, the uglier side of our religion and politics history. Uh, and my guess is that's, that, that will be a, a key moment that we'll remember, uh, and it will be challenged. Uh, I, I, I think it will be challenged by Muslim Americans who will become more active in coming years as their demography grows and their political cloud grows. Well, it wasn't just Muslims. I mean, Mitt Romney had to defend why a Mormon, you know, is qualified in the other big speech during the primary season. Another big speech was his speech talking about his Mormon faith. And as we saw even in our video, it seemed like all of the candidates across the board felt compelled to swear allegiance to Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, there was this uh, Jesus Christ is my personal savior language across the board. I mean, it's not just when are we going to see a Muslim president, but, you know, is there still that prevailing uh, test for religious test? Sure. Well, I mean, if that's who you are, I think that's fair to say. Some people may not like it, but if that's who you are, I think in putting on a bit of an altruistic hat, but it's one I own, um, is that what is vitally vitally important in this faith work in politics is that you get up every morning and you know that you're going to make sure that every person of faith or person who doesn't have a faith has a voice in the public square. The pulpit needs to be big enough for everybody, regardless of the size of your faith, your denomination, regardless if you don't have one. There's got to be voices. There's got to be places for everyone to have a voice. That's what matters. For a number of years, progressive people of faith lacked a voice in the public square. And a lot of it had to do with progressive people of politics not engaging them, not bringing it together. We're doing that now. Jim Wallace the other day, Jim Wallace Go to the website, God's Politics, and look at a letter he released yesterday challenging James Dobson on a letter James Dobson wrote. I mean, go look at the back and forth. I mean, there's a fair and equal debate going on out there on what's fair, right, and humane coming from faith leaders. Um, so that's good. What has to happen is has to remain good. If we continue to be successful in this work, then one of our goals every day has to be that everybody has a voice, that we're not seeking to dominate the microphone, to control it on faith. I don't mind Democrats controlling the microphone, yeah. personally, but on faith and in the faith world, it's about a fair and level conversation. And that I will fight for. I mean, that's important. Well, speaking of dominating the microphone, we should invite our audience to get involved as well. Um, I will I take some questions. Let me just do a couple of ground rules first. Uh, the first one is that we would ask that you do indeed ask a question and keep the sermonizing and the campaign stumping and all of that for a different venue. Um, <laughs> we'd like to keep that just questions for our panelists. And you can direct it to someone in particular or, or um, to the panel in general. And when you do ask your question, please do identify yourself. Uh, and um, if you have an affiliation, let us know what that is. We do have some handheld mics going around. So when I call on you, please do wait for the microphone as well. So do we have some questions? I, your hand did come up first. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> please do I'm, use the mic. Sure. I'm Gil Hill. I uh, uh, was at uh, Woodrow Wilson Fellow in 73, 74, the year of Watergate fascinating year to be a fellow. Um, my, I have uh, a question about the discussion. The discussion has been almost totally positive on the role of religion in politics. I would observe that religion in politics can do damage as well. A good example is two of the programs 
of the Bush administration that have been stained by religious values. The program of contraception that is supported in both uh, Title X of the Public Health Service Act and also uh, in research conducted at NIH. And the, the program that uh, provides AIDS treatment to Africa. Both of these programs have been weakened by the intrusion of the religious value that holds abstinence only as the way to really control sexual behavior. And I find that tragic. And so the question and th that's a, I'm going to make a segue to a question. The Bush administration had a faith-based program that failed. None of you discussed it. I'd be very interested in your take on that program and the reason that it failed. I would say quickly and simply that the Clinton administration had a successful faith-based program that actually funded more resources into the faith community and was not politicized. We didn't hear much about it. It just worked. Um, I would say that the Bush administration politicized the program. My experience in the legislative process on the Hill was that we went through some harsh battles over employment status, hiring and firing, things that were not issues prior to Bush. That's a, it's a great question. It's one I struggle with. I struggle with both directions. You know, what's tarnishing what and when? Uh, you know, faith to politics, politics to faith, you know. And it, it's, a, it's a tough question. Of course, part of the answer is that you know, to change the dynamic on election day, certainly, um, on, on where positions come out of the Oval Office, come out of the White House. But the, the faith-based office, go to David Quo's book who, from a few years ago and look at that. But I think that it changed dramatically under Bush. But the point I'm making here is that it existed. It was there. And it was quite a successful operation because, you know, it was required that churches, that faith groups set up nonprofits, that the money went worked through the nonprofits, various, various things that made the tax money, you know, fair, that made the spending what I consider fair. And I just think it was political. I think that the faith office turned into a political tool. I mean, I think it, it's, there, there's other areas where it, it's a continuing tension and there is a danger. You know, one is this kind of struggle between science and religion. And this is not, uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of it under the Bush years, but um, we can find other examples. But sometimes those are at odds with each other, uh, religious teachings and science teachings, stem cell research, for example. And that's an area where I think uh, it, it'll be, I don't have a position, but I do think uh, there'll be many critics who, uh, kind of push back against the intrusion of religious values on foreign policy. It's another area. Often religious ideas have been used uh, to legitimate kind of aggressive military stances, whether we're talking about anti-communism in the 1950s, which again, uh, often relied on, uh, on Christian leaders, uh, conservative Christian leaders, to, to help give it legitimacy through the war on terrorism uh, with some of the rhetoric that President Bush has used uh, to, to, you know, uh, kind of uh, legitimate the goal. So I think you're right. I mean, I think uh, a lot of Americans will, will be uncomfortable how this plays out in public policy as opposed to candidates explaining uh, their faith or reaching out to faith organizations. And both parties have to be very kind of careful um, navigating this balance. Sally Steenlin with the Center for American Progress. <clears throat> and my question has to do with evangelicals. Um, in 2006, the Democratic Party made some 
uh, inroads in that uh, community in elections. And what a lot of experts said at the time was it wasn't so much that evangelicals went to the Democrats, but that they left the Republicans uh, because the, the brand was so tarnished. In the two years since 2006, what is your sense of that movement? It had have the Democrats closed the deal more and there's more loyalty among evangelicals? Have they moved more solidly towards the Democrats? Or is there just a kind of wandering in the wilderness and they haven't closed the deal and they're just still rejecting the Republicans? Well, I wanna, I wanna say we're closing the deal, <laughs> but I mean- that's We'll a, see Tuesday. Yeah, that's a really good question. In 2006, and, and you can even go into key congressional races and look where we did very specific organizing and messaging into faith communities and you can see a uptick five even ten percent you know in, in within evangelical and Catholic universes down in Alabama right now two congressional races Bobby Bright is the Democrat in Montgomery running against a fellow deacon from First Baptist Church Imagine what it's like there on Sunday mornings. <laughs> um, really tough race. And then up in Bud Kramer's district, Congressman Kramer, Democrat, is retiring. Parker Griffith, an oncologist, is the Democrat running in his place. Um, both have come under attack from some 527s. They have um, challenged their values. And who has come to the defense of these two Democrats? The Christian Coalition. The Christian Coalition of Alabama has done statements, they've done interviews, they've done op-eds telling the 527s to get out of Dodge and leave these guys alone because they are authentically people of faith. And that's our test. So there have been, there have been changes and that out there in the electorate Again, smoothing the edges, creating relationships that work and create some honesty across the board um, matters dramatically. I think a lot of people have stepped into the wilderness, quite honestly. But that gives us a chance to throw manna from our side as well and um, talk to, you know, create a, a conversation out there. I think. Um, I look forward to seeing what happens on this election day and how we move forward with the outcome. There was a study with, by Pew a couple of month, a month ago or something that said they hadn't moved that much uh, and it's kind of they're, they're locked in place. Uh, but it would be interesting. I mean, the combination of organizational efforts such as what you're doing uh, combined with the economy. I mean, churchgoers also have to eat. Uh, and they have to retire. And uh, you know the economy and the shifts in the last month, it would be interesting in this election how much that might change uh, voting patterns. Um, but it, it's, it's amazing how, it, how hard it is to move that group uh, at this point. Well, and I would add a couple of points too. I'm keeping my eye on young evangelicals. Uh, yeah, you know, there's been right. a lot of talk this come around that young evangelicals are so much more liberal than their parents. And um, we, just to plug, uh, my show a little bit. We just did a survey that we released last week where we focused on young evangelicals. We released some of the data a couple weeks earlier, actually. But we did find that the majority of young evangelicals are still supporting John McCain, although at lower rates than older evangelicals. So, you know, they're still Republican, it looks like, uh, but not maybe as Republican. But when you're talking about these numbers, even a couple of points can make a, a big difference. So even if it's a little bit lower, that, that's a lot of votes. And in a close election, it could make a difference. But again, it's hard to know how much is based on the unique circumstances of this election, the personalities involved, Barack Obama, John McCain, Sarah Palin, Joe Biden, you know, and how much of this represents longstanding term, uh, trends. And the issue of race. And, 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 and how race, much does yeah. that play into the you know, maybe there was momentum since 2006, and that's where you see some of the racial issue come in. I don't know, but that would be the other issue we'd have to look at. So it's hard for me to see. Uh Again, I mean, I think that with McCain, I don't know where he is on this. I always get the sense he's uncomfortable with, with some of this discussion. Barack Obama is clearly personally comfortable with talking about his religion, and politically, it's very important. 
Uh, so, you know, I, I think you have the convergence. But again, we've always had religious values influence our politics. We've always had religion as part of American public policy. Kind of Protestant values were very important for much of the 19th century and, and the early 20th century in shaping uh, issues of poverty, immigration, and we're a religious nation. Uh, that's the big secret. Uh, and, and this has a very uh, long history, and, and I think it will continue. And I think there's certain issue areas where there'll be more tension. Uh, again, maybe with scientific matters, but um, you know, even though if, if, if there's a calculation to say a little more clearly how much you believe in God, uh, I don't think that negates a broader uh, kind of trend in American politics that uh, we take our uh, religious uh, religion seriously in, in Washington. Yes. Pat Zafer with Catholic News Service. Four years ago, values voters seemed to be interpreted largely as voting on abortion and gay rights generally. Rick Warren and Jim Wallace have changed what values voters are supposed to be about for evangelicals somewhat, uh, adding in AIDS and poverty, for instance, into the equation. Doug Kmick and Nick Cafardi have tried to change for Catholics what the Catholic values voter is, is about. A, has that changed permanently? Has that changed what the conversation is about for values voters on a, for an ongoing basis? And if it has changed, um, what does the next president, the next administration have to do to make sure that those people's expectations are met? That, you know, the, for instance, assuming it's a democratic presidency, um, that the efforts will be made to reduce abortions, that the emphasis will be on poverty. Uh, or same, same question actually with McCain, you know, that the emphasis will be on reducing abortions. How, do, how does the equation stay changed? I think the redefining is going to stick for a lot of reasons. I think that, um, you know, and you mentioned two folks there, you know, there's been a, um, um, th there have been new leaders of faith communities rise to prominence for the simple reason that some of the older ones have passed away. Um, um, for some that I think maybe the, the people on the pews are driving it a little bit. They want a larger conversation. That these new leaders are calling for it. Um, it gives itself to a better conversation with the pre progressive community because a lot of those issues they're talking about match progressive ideals more than they do conservative. So as I had mentioned earlier, you know, that's why the safe outreach effort from Democrats and this new look at issues, broader issues, by many evangelicals and Catholics. And there's no way to talk about these two groups as being monochromatic. I mean, they're massive, and they're Americans, you know. And our neighborhoods, are, some of them are in SUVs, some are in Hummers, some are in, you know, Priuses. I mean, they're just all over the place. And um, so I, I, think, I think when we get down to the term values voter, that the fact is, is that people of faith see everything through the prism of, of their values. We all do. We all have a set of values. Church folks get their values from the pulpit, from Sunday school. So, you know, it's just about making it so, saying it and making it so in politics. You know, if, if there's a lot of perception in politics, we learn that in college and we learn it in practice. Well, then let's say it and make it so. And, um, and um, take that title away from the right, where they've tried to make it about just two or three issues. It's not fair to the voter. Um, so the question is, how does that impact policy going forward? Um, well, certainly, um, I think largely the candidates are, Senator Obama's comfortable in his own faith skin and is driven very much by, by his faith, and I think that it will certainly impact policy. And um, I think that the impact is in what he's saying. I think that the policy, that his commitment on policy, his positions in the campaign are his values, you know. So I think that, I think that's what we'll see. Um, I'm kind of jumping around here. I think, I mean, one of the interesting differences between the conservatives in the 70s and liberals today 
is conservatives had a set of very specific issues that they used to sway voters their way. So you had abortion, you had pornography, uh, you had to a certain extent national security and anti-communism. Uh, but certainly with abortion and photography, it was very specific. If you're with us on this set of policies, join the party. Democrats seem to be doing something different now. Uh, they are kind of replicating organizational ties, which is what conservatives did. But they don't have a specific issue. It's not, there's not one hot button issue, it seems, that uh, the Democratic Party is using. It's more a broader argument uh, that if, if you have these values, uh, they match up with what we're trying to achieve with our policy. So progressive economic policies match uh, with what you might learn uh, from, from the pulpit. Uh, but I think there is an added challenge when you do that. Um, because it, 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 even to weigh the next administration, it was clear how you evaluated Republicans. Where did, what did they do on abortion? What did they do on pornography? What did they do on any of the issues raised, evolution? Uh, I don't know. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a bigger change that Democrats are trying to do here, because it's not just linked to a certain amount of issues. It's a, our party fits you better, but it's also going to be harder, because it's more abstract, I think, and, and it's a bigger pitch uh, that they're trying to make. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated as well among the conservatives. There might be a broader conversation going on. And I've been doing some interviews for some of the reporting I've been doing and talking to people. And they might care about the environment. They might care about poverty and AIDS, orphans in Africa. But when I say, well, what are the issues you're voting on? They care about those issues. But a lot of the conservatives I'm talking to still say, I'm voting on abortion. That's my number one issue. And I say, why? There's all these other issues you care about. And I interviewed some folks um, last week, who, some very articulate young people at a college, and they said, because that's the foundational issue for us. And I think the Catholic uh, bishops had a problem with their statement as well when they you know, released this whole list of things that Catholics should be concerned about and Catholics should take into account when they vote. But it seems like abortion has this special place, and there is this certain sure. um, weight that's given to that issue, and I think that is a challenge. Interesting. Quick anecdote. I'm involved in a nonprofit project with a Republican consultant who did the religious outreach for Mr. Romney. And so therefore, I came across this PowerPoint the other day. And <laughs> Which you're now I, sharing with all of us. I'm looking like through that. it. It is identical to what I would have created, talking about evangelicals and Catholics. I mean, my whole office was gathered around looking at it. We were fascinated by the fact that it was the same in terms of defining what he sees happening in the country. He was talking about Darfur and, and poverty, you know, just like we would. It was really, really interesting, encouraging, common ground. It will be interesting if Barack Obama, as he did in the debate, if Democrats do shift on abortion and kind of focus on reducing abortion rather than the pro-anti-abortion question uh, if that takes the mm -hmm. issue off the table. I mean, that would probably be the most powerful thing in some ways at the immediate level the Democrats could do. I don't know if they want to do it, there's splits over it, um, but it would be interesting what effect that might have in opening up this political game. Exactly. Um, more questions? Yes, there's, I see a hand over here. Uh, I'm Dale Hill uh, from Woodrow Wilson School 76, and I am a Unitarian. I'm. Uh, a little torn between two questions, but um, <laughs> I'll just say what they are. You know, one, one has <laughs> to do with moment. why the religious leaders are not speaking out on the conduct of elections. But the other one uh, has to do with whether a person who is either not believing in God or Jesus or is actively seeking a spiritual journey would ever make it in a race for the presidency, or indeed for Congress. Uh, we did have a sermon in our church recently, which was called The Last Closet. And it was basically asserting that, OK, we've taken care of gays and other groups, but atheists or people who are unclear about their faith are really you know, still left in the lurch. So I'd be interested in your views on that latter question. Sure, it's a, you know, largely it's an electoral issue. You know, it's, it's, it's um, coming down to driving yourself to 50 plus percent on election day. Now, here's one reminder, comment about our changing diversity. Growing up, we called it a Baptist quilt because they were all different colors, you know. 
and um, um, Twin Cities has a Muslim congressman. Atlanta, part of Atlanta, has a Buddhist congressman um, who are very active in the House Democratic Faith Working Group and sit down with um, the African Methodist Episcopal Jim Clyburn and the Catholic Nancy Pelosi and the Baptist Lincoln Davis from Tennessee and they have really robust conversations and good conversations about the country and policy and so there's encouraging things going on and to remind ourselves that. But that's a tough question, could they win the electorate? Um, um, you know, it's changing, the country's changing, but you know, the change can come slow as we see different faces in our communities. Um, I hope it comes fast, personally, and I think that it's part, for me it's just about part of faith outreach. Ultimately what I do, my, my personal goals, like I said earlier, is to have these microphones in the public square for every single person. And um, if we can hold on to that, we can do some good for the whole country and not just a party. We'll see if we can hold on to that because this is politics. It's hard. It's hard to imagine someone running for president now who's secular. I, just, yeah. I can't see it. Uh, and, and I don't know that's a lot. I mean, I could see in Congress uh, for certain districts it wouldn't be a problem or even for the Senate. But at this moment, uh, there's too much at stake. I mean, there's both a bias probably against a large part of the electorate, but there's just too much at stake to lose uh, either party, uh, all that organizational muscle. Uh, you know, Reagan wasn't particularly religious, and he pulled it off. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that might be the kind of, of balance, but I, I don't think someone can run away from religion and run for president yeah. right now. First time I went to San Francisco to meet with the San Francisco Interfaith Council was fascinating for me. And I remember standing in the receiving line and they come through and like the third person represented the Wiccans, the sixth person was an atheist. So like the 13th person I met finally was a Presbyterian, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I remember telling them, I'm like, you know, this is really it. Back home in Grenada, Mississippi, the Interfaith Catholic <laughs> Council is a Baptist and Methodist at Winkies, you know, having a hamburger. And, you know, our country is diverse in different places. And, you know, as we work to be one country, we have to, um, have to work hard for the whole country to be one because... We certainly have tendencies, obvious tendencies, to understand the country through our own communities, you know. And um, you're exactly right. I mean, there's going to be opportunities in many congressional districts in coming years to diversify Congress and the Senate as well. I would point out, a, there was a survey that was done by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life in August, which found that more than 70% of all Americans say they do want a president with strong religious beliefs. And that number is pretty consistent, I think, um, as, as they've been doing those polling numbers. We have time for just a couple more questions. I'll stay over at that table. Yes. To follow on this question that you've just been discussing, I've been interested in the fact that, uh, at least in my observation, very little has been made of the fact that that uh, uh, Barack Obama's church, Reverend Wright's church, has a denominational connection with the United Church of Christ, which has to be one of the most liberal denominations in the country. One would think that this might, and I, I'm wondering why so little attention has been paid to that, because one would think that uh, this, uh, it's, what, what was your term? It's uh, progressive people of faith that the UCC would be uh, uh, particularly fault for the most part in that uh, that category, and Reverend Wright's church is really not uh, not typical of the UCC. Somebody could have made something of the fact that it is such a liberal church, and that that no doesn't seem to have been uh, have taken place. Well, I'm very pleased at that that it hasn't taken place. But I'm just interested in the context of the conversation you were just having, what uh, implications there are from that. Well, maybe it's harder to explain a denomination to the American public and to deliver the message. It's easier to make them the most liberal member of the Senate. 
you know, bam, there it is. Um, when I was a Southern Baptist missionary in Asia, um, some of my finest friends to this day were UCC missionaries in the community I was in, incredible family, it has children all over America now that they were little kids when I was there. And um, they come to our house for holidays here in DC. Um, and I got to learn a lot about that denomination while I was there with my denomination. Um, but I think that it's just politically speaking, if I was laying out a strategy um, and the polling showed that the biggest hit was to make him a liberal, it would be a whole lot easier to use Senate voting records than A, explain the denomination and then sell it to the American people. And I think it undermined, I'm not sure this is the case, but in some ways what made Reverend Wright so potent um, wasn't that he was too liberal, it was kind of, he was really anti-American. And so why is Barack Obama sitting and listening to sermons about this? And from people I know who are members of the church, it, it was the kind of progressive context of the church that made it so appealing on all sorts of issues, denominational, political. Yeah. And it might have undermined the effect of that kind of right attack uh, to give too much context. I think what they wanted was, for Republican operatives, that one clip uh, about America. Well, and to put him in with a mainline denomination that's part of, right. although on the liberal end, but part of the American mainstream um, of religion, historic Protestantism, would have yeah, defeated the purpose of the people who were really, I think there was a lot of politics going on too, and that would have defeated the purpose. Maybe time for one more question. I should go back over on this side, I think. Yes? Uh, Sarah Posner with the American Prospect. I have been pondering watching Sarah Palin and the coverage of her, including my own coverage of her, um, whether a Pentecostal could become president. And to me, it seems like there's a line that reporters are not sure where it is between the candidates religious practices and beliefs and how those beliefs impact policy making. And I think in her case, um, there was a lot of misunderstanding of Pentecostal religious practices like speaking in tongues and laying on of hands. And people didn't know how to interpret some of the videos of her with respect to some of those religious practices and how that impacted her policy. But I was just wondering whether that lack of understanding, even among conservative Republicans, you know, where, where that line is between the candidates' practices, you know, and where is it off limits to go into that, and where, where it's fair game to look at how those practices might, or beliefs might impact policy. That was actually a question I was going to ask the panel as well before we didn't get to it, so I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the coverage of Governor Palin has been interesting. And I will tell you this, you know, being from a town of about 9,000 out in the rural areas, I have had my moments of feeling, feeling offended by some of the comments and attacks and have wanted people to pull back very, very hard to just where she stands on the issues, where I disagree and which would drive me not to be for her. Um, um, Pentecostalism, you, you know, you'd have to look at the person running. I mean, obviously, there would be questions to answer and people would have to understand what that's all about. The gifts of the Spirit, sanctification, being separated, being um, anointed by the Holy Spirit. All evangelicals and most denominations believe that on some level in their theology. But they accept the gifts of the Spirit and practice them. And um, so that's hard to explain to the mass of America. It really is. And um, um, you know, that's an interesting question. I was just say I was imagining the right Pentecostal, the Bill Clinton Pentecostal, you know, stepping forward and running, somebody with the ability to maneuver themselves beyond that. But it would be hard. I mean, that would be tough. But I, I mean, I, and I think if you look at every religion, if you sit in, in, in your institution, you could probably find moments when you can think, boy, what would this look like on YouTube? Uh, if I was running, running for the presidency. Uh, and, and Romney had a quote about that during the primaries where someone was asking about Mormonism. He said, yeah, I, he made a comment about a red man coming down the chimney. 
uh, once a year to give your kids presents and, and you know kind of questioning you know what what is normal and what's not um, and you know this you know uh, Kennedy's challenge was this the question was a was kind of pure ugly anti-Catholicism and the second was you know would you be listening to the Pope to make your decisions. And his argument was, I am a Catholic. There's nothing wrong with being a Catholic, but that's not how I'm going to make my decisions. I understand the distinction between uh, my beliefs in the church and my beliefs in the White House. Uh, and ultimately, I think uh, that's the kind of argument uh, that the successful politician, whether a Pentecostal or any other religion, uh, does have to still make in, in the public arena. Uh, to bridge those divisions and to overcome uh, kind of that, that other part of the religion and politics mix that some people are nervous about. Well, obviously, we could keep talking about this for a lot longer, and I know there were a lot more questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them. But thank you all for coming out and being such attentive audience members. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to having more conversations in the days ahead. Thanks a lot. <laughs>